I'd like to turn it over to our speaker for today, uh, Susan Steffen of eTech Law, um, and she's also a professor at the University of Cincinnati College of Law and an adjunct professor at uh, Mitchell Hamlin. And so with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah, and welcome everyone. I'm so glad to see so many of you able to join today. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I have a, I have a very small um, Minneapolis-based firm where I mostly do consulting with other attorneys on issues of law and technology when they have clients with issues that come up that, um, that a lot of us really learned about in law school. Um, and I also primarily uh, am administrator of a program at University of Cincinnati College of Law, Master of Legal Studies program, and I teach there in many different technology uh, areas, uh, privacy, cybersecurity, and um, this fall for the first time, law and technology, of, or the law and regulation of law blockchain technology. So I'm, I'm excited to um, introduce law students to this topic. And I do want to say that I, um, I have attended and presented at many CLEs, and I know the most helpful ones are the ones you get a whole lot of practical knowledge, maybe some forms, um, take away um, a great, uh, a greater at least understanding of the topic. Um, we'll say up front, this is not one of those areas yet. I hope that uh, soon we'll have a lot more practical guidance in the area of blockchain technology and the law and what we need to know to help our clients. But right now, um, there is a lot of uncertainty. And I am looking forward to giving a brief introdu introduction of the blockchain technology. The, the, we're not going to get into a lot of technical details. I don't think attorneys need to know a lot of technical details. I am not certainly a coder or someone with an intense technological background um, myself, but my interest is in helping uh, attorneys understand a little bit about what they need to know about the blockchain technology to help better assist clients. So that's what I'm going to at least introduce today. So we're going to start out um, with a brief overview. We're going to address smart contracts and what the heck that is. Um, cryptocurrency just a little bit. This isn't going to be a how to invest in, um, in Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency uh, topic by any means. And, and, and of course, not only is this not legal advice, but it's certainly not investment advice. And, um, and, and I, I, will, I will not give any because who knows, number one, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we'll talk about evidentiary considerations and how blockchain technology might be used in that capacity, the forensic challenges that we face, just a little. Again, we're not getting too deep into the weeds on the technology part. And then kind of a big overview of what are the opportunities um, and the perils and the promises um, that we are going to face and that our clients might be facing uh, as well. So with that, um, first an over overview, what is blockchain? Well, this really is has only been a thing since 2008. Um, the pseudonymous Satoshi Nakamoto, we still don't know who that individual or group of individuals is, published a white paper entitled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system in an online discussion group of, you know, a big couple hundred like-minded individuals. Um, and this is the first time that was proposed a decentralized distributed ledger technology. That's what blockchain is, a decentralized distributor ledger technology that supports an electronic payment system based on cryptographic proof. Um, so what this is, is the genesis of Bitcoin and the blockchain technology that supports it. Now, um, fast forward 13 years or so, um, as the uses for blockchain develop and diversify, the technology's underlying structure continues to be, for sure, promising and absolutely perilous in terms of legal transactions. And we certainly have seen a lot in the news lately about the uh, cryptocurrency end of the blockchain technology, which is still the far and away most prominent use of the blockchain. But we're gonna to talk today about some other uses that you might have encountered, your clients might have encountered, or you might encounter in the future. So what is blockchain? Well, blockchain is, I'm going to, I'm going to go through a, a few different definitions and um, they might not resonate right away because it really is something that we as attorneys aren't necessarily trained to, um, to understand intuitively. Um, but it's public, transparent, decentralized, and encrypted record of online transactions. It's a lot of code that is strung together to make an electronic 
a record, the result of digital transactions that are encrypted and stored in blocks is the way we look at it, although it really is, you know, this is a visualization in the background here, um, but it's, it's, it's not quite something that we can draw in, in a picture. Um, and, and they're connected by the fact that each block contains identifying information, um, the hash digest, as the technical term is, of the block before it, and then it continues on into a chain. It's a digital ledger that time stamps transactions by hashing them onto this ongoing chain based on proof of work, um, which we'll talk about briefly, that forms a record that can't be changed without redoing the proof of work. And that comes as a quote from the original white paper. Um, it's supported by asymmetric or public key cryptography by which public key and a private key, so we have two really strings of digits um, that remains undisclosed, a private key does, um, that work together to ensure security. And so parties of a transaction can verify integrity and authenticity of these public transactions without ever knowing who the other party is and without, as I mentioned, going through a central authority because it's a decentralized system. So you don't have to go through, say, any uh, bank to do a transaction based on a cryptocurrency or a smart contract. So Again, cryptocurrencies are far and away the largest use of blockchain technology, and we'll talk briefly about those because that's, a, that's one of the exciting topics that's been in the news a lot. But I do want to address the concept of smart contracts first, and one, as one of the developing blockchain applications. So what a smart contract is, is it's code or an algorithm that is hosted on a blockchain platform or block, using blockchain technology that facilitates transactions by generating output based on the occurrence of a pre-programmed condition. So well, I'll break that down in a moment in a, in a way that might make more sense. So, so sometimes these are self-executing, hence the original term smart. And they tend to be really more programs than actual contracts. The originator of the name has, has gone on record saying he regrets calling it a smart contract because it really isn't a contract. It's a program that creates an outcome based on input. Um, so it can be more of an automatic process as well as involving an agreement. It's not artificial intelligence. They need programming to function. And they might make a part of, but not all, a legally enforce, enforceable contract. So they, they can be part of a contract, but they're generally not actually a contract in and of themselves. And um, there's a common opinion and they're neither smart nor a contract. They're not artificial intelligence and they're not really a contract. Um, they're just a series of events. So to break that down an example, example is a vending machine, right? A vending machines programmed with transactional rules. Money put in, item selected, uh, item pops out, right? So it's the same concept. The machine confirms the amount is correct and sends out the goods. And this is really how a smart contract functions as well. So it's conditional instructions, not really a contract. So that makes sense. Another you know, example might be, might be gambling. So how can you use this smart contract concept? Well, one of the ways is, let's say you want to place a bet without a bookie, right? So you've got uh, party A and party B, who are fans of the WNBA, strangers, but they want to bet $500 even money on a game, right? So smart contracts can play the role of a bookie and be set up to Broadcast the availability of bets, you know, who, who, any takers, match the betters with, with the terms that they're interested in, provide the platform, collect and hold funds electronically, of course, and then pay out the winner uh, when the event is over and one of the teams has won. So how that works is the terms, the rules, conditions are established and translated into code. Uh, the events, if they are set forth in, if, if the events set forth in the program conditions occur, then the code automatically executes and transfers value to the whomever is entitled under the conditions. The transaction and transfer value will, will be then recorded on the blockchain. So it is part of this immutable ledger and the transactions just keep flowing one after the other. 
So probably the most common question would be, oh, all right, but how, how does it know who gets paid, right? How are, is the outcome of these set conditions communicated? Well, that brings in the concept of an oracle, right? Not, not necessarily all knowing, but some outside external entity, program, device that provides the required data to the smart contract. So the smart contract is programmed to do check maybe a particular uh, reliable source of WNBA game scores, right? And, and as soon as the outcome is then um, taken from the Oracle, uh, that continues on and allows the conditions to process and the outcome to happen without someone actually intervening. Everything is all pre-programmed. It finds and verifies the data, sends it to the blockchain or the smart contract directly, and, and that, that's how the magic happens. So this is an interesting um, concept in the uh, in the in in the in the in the functioning of this concept, this smart concept. The, the, the biggest platform that the first platform that allowed the opportunity for smart contracts is Ethereum. And the Ethereum platform is blockchain-based and it relies on distributed ledgers. Um, it has its own cryptocurrency. You might have heard of Ether at Chain. It trades as ETH. And um, it is a platform that focuses on developing smart contracts and the opportunities for developers to build decentralized applications known as dApps. If nothing else today, you'll get a lot of you know, lingo bandied about that, that might, might be helpful and it might just be uh, confusing. But um, dApps create a new digital asset, maybe build virtual worlds, all sorts of practical stuff, right? So you can create decentralized applications that are based on the concept of a smart contract. So they function automatically without a third party getting involved. Uh, Ethereum has been in the news because they have upcoming what's known as the merge, the Ethereum merge, where their platform is transitioning from a proof of work to a proof of stake consensus mechanism. By the end of the year, they're saying maybe September 19th, it keeps get putting off. We'll see they've got now two um, concurrently operating um, blockchains that they are going to merge. What could, what could go wrong, right? I don't know, I imagine quite a lot, but it'll be interesting to see what happens. And just a word again, we're not going to get too much into the details of the technology, but um, proof of work versus proof of stake um, are two different ways to come to a consensus to validate what can be added to the block. Proof of work is the original concept of the Satoshi Nakamoto paper, and that involves a whole lot of computing power and electricity and um, time time, um, but mostly computing power to validate an, uh, a, an algorithm and, and find, you know, and, and basically solve a complicated math problem. And the first uh, miner, as they're called, to solve this math problem gets to validate the transaction and approve the addition of something to a block, and then they get paid in, in Bitcoin or whatever the native currency is that they're working with. Um, so, and that is seen to be very, um, um, environmentally unfriendly because of the extreme amount of electricity is used. Proof, proof of stake is another validation method that simply um, gives to the individual with the most stake in the particular native currency the opportunity to validate. So the one who holds the most, um, because that, that person has in theory, a lot more to lose if the platform becomes unstable or untrustworthy. So we trust the person who has the highest stake in it to validate the transactions. They say this is 99% more environmentally friendly, uses less energy. And um, of course, there are, as you, you might imagine, uh, issues with proof of stake as well. We're worried about the hoarding of, of power, uh, oligopoly type behavior, um, et cetera. Um, but, uh, but in any case, there, there are issues with all of these validations and it is seeming that there are tendencies towards wanting to go to proof of stake for environmental reasons and efficiency reasons as well. There are 
many other um, me methods of consensus, consensus that are out there, but those are the main ones probably hear about. So I just wanted to, to mention that if you hear about the merge that's coming, if you're paying attention to some of the technology news, um, that's what that is. Uh, we also have, of course, um, this concept of dApps that I mentioned, decentralized applications. And they run on peer-to-peer -peer networks. So each computer that is involved in, for the individual is a node on the network, part of the network. Um, and so anyone who is working with a particular blockchain generally will have a copy of that blockchain on the individual computer. Um, their system that they're working with. And that's one of the reasons that the blockchain technology is seen as pretty much immutable and difficult to, uh, to change uh, unwittingly because you have to um, hack into, you have, well, you have to have more than 51% of control of all of the nodes and that's very difficult to do and requires probably more energy than would be feasible and would be worth the while. So, um, so that's a kind of a, a simple overview of, of why um, this is this is uh, seen as immutable. And so ADAPT is an application that runs on a blockchain technology and uses this cryptographic technology to store, da sort, store data um, using a system of token generation. So we'll talk about tokens on the next slide um, and, and what those are. But of course, you know, a Cryptocurrency is considered a token, and we also have non-fungible tokens that we'll talk about. Um, but Bitcoin is an example of a blockchain decentralized app application or DAP. Ethereum, also a DAP, is a smart contract platform that has its own blockchain that others can use. Primarily, each cryptocurrency, each application of some of these uh, transactions will have its own blockchain. Uh, but Ethereum supports the individual applications of many different users. Um, payment on Ethereum is made in Ether, and um, it's um, it has been a very popular platform. It's um, we, in the early days it was almost taken down by the amazing demand that um, people be able to purchase a little uh, a digital representation of a crypto kitty. Each one is unique, and um, people just really wanted in on this such that the uh, Ethereum network almost crashed uh, for, for a while because of the interest in this kind of um, decentralized application, the owning of a digital representation of a kitty dressed in one of many different costumes. So let's get to break down a little bit more about the tokens then. So token is code. It's, it's not, you know, it's not something we can really visualize. You want to see, see it as a coin when you're talking about Bitcoin and all the other coins that are out there. It's really just code made up of distinctive asset references, a unique property or specific legal rights in accordance with the smart contract through which the token was generated. So that makes sense. <laughs> the slides will be available. Um, once tokenized, an asset can be freely transferred, exchanged, or stored in a compatible platform. So, of course, Bitcoin and all the other cryptocurrencies are traded on, on, on various markets. Um, then we have the concept of a non-fungible token, NFTs, we've also heard a lot about lately. And that is a cryptographic token that represents a unique digital asset that cannot be exchanged for another type of digital asset. So it's not cryptocurrency, it is a, but it is nonetheless a distinctive, unique asset that can be purchased and owned. NFT is different from cryptocurrency and blockchain utility tokens like Bitcoin and, and Ether, which are fungible. So you know, something that can be used as currency and is commonly and created with smart contract technology. Um, they, uh, sales of these NFTs, again, here you, you, celebrities are getting involved, sports figures, you know, a lot of people are getting involved in creating and um, selling NFTs, sometimes promoting NFTs for sale, which is which is an issue that we'll discuss briefly, um, but it, it, it's $25 billion worth of NFT sales were recorded in 2021. Um, so, so this is a thing. 
significant and something that probably isn't going to go away anytime soon. Um, it's seen as a brand new asset class for the IRS from for taxation purposes. So this is one of the attorney triggers that we are going to want to be aware of is what are the taxable ramifications of certainly cryptocurrencies or anything that is um, in, involving a blockchain technology, including NFTs. Um, you know, you, you, buying, selling, minting these NFTs are seen as an IRS asset class. And also, if there is you know, an invitation to invest, right, that should also trigger concern. Um, is an NFT being used to raise capital? If so, the SEC is very interested. Um, the regulated securities um, can be the classification by the SEC if the um, NFTs or tokens are being used for in, you know, boring investment. Right. And the SEC, um, for those of you who may or may not be security lawyers, um, I'm not a security lawyer, but I do know about the Howey test. And that's how, um, you know, a, an investment contract, just a, a brief foray into the Howey contest for, for, for Howey test on the SEC v. Howey. This is how uh, still we determine whether or not a transaction is an investment contract, therefore subject to the SEC rules for disclosure and regulation. Um, is there investment of money in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit to be derived from the efforts of others? So this is something that, again, another red flag that we want to consider when we're looking at dealing in any of these tokens. Um, the SEC did rule several years ago that tokens um, in exchange for Ether does violate securities law um, in some situations, uh, and, and we want to just keep an eye out for that in the in the future. Hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Again, those are two of the, the main legal issues, primarily looking at uh, cryptocurrency and um, non-fungible tokens, but uh, the, the law and regulation of all of, of the blockchain technology is, is to a great extent up in the air. Um, so so when we'll go back to the uncertainty surrounding that, but I do want to step back and think about the use of smart contracts in, um, in our lives as attorneys, right? Are clients using smart contracts? Is this something that has come up yet? Um, my, my prediction is if, if not, it will. Someone will at least ask about it fairly soon. Some states permit the use of start con smart contracts and blockchain specifically for legal documents in certain contexts. Um, Arizona allows enforceable legal agreements to be created via smart contracts. California allows marriage licenses to be issued um, using blockchain technology, which is, which is very interesting. We'll talk about the other uses um, briefly as well. Delaware instituted a blockchain initiative to help businesses automate legal and operational activities using smart contract technology. Ohio allows governmental entity to utilize distributed ledger technology, including blockchain. Uh, and I can tell you that this, you know, states that, um, that, that, don't have these specific, uh, uh, you know, provisions are certainly looking into it. Uh, there is a list um, that is uh, that this more comprehensive with blockchain legislation that's available through this link. Again, this, the slides will be available. You can also Google the National Council of State Legislatures and look for their blockchain legislation. So it is interesting to see where uh, these states are in this uh, in in this area, and um, they are. It's, it's growing for sure. And so it is not, it's certainly one of the states that is considering the use of, you know, the, the explicit um, use of blockchain technology and how they want to look at legislating. So smart contracts certainly may, may be more viable for some parties to legal agreements, potentially lowering the costs incurred from using lawyers, right? And other intermediaries. Um, if you, this, <laughs> I think we're a long way away from that. And again, I think that lawyers are always going to need to be available to look at the bigger picture and the bigger picture agreement. And just you know, having the ability to integrate a smart contract functionality might be something there's more of a call for um, in the future. I don't know how near future, but it absolutely is happening. And as other states get behind it for, for various reasons, um, it, it, I, it probably will become more and more common and probably we're going to have to be pulled kicking and screaming into this, this, this realm. We're not going to have to know code. We're just going to have to understand um, how it's going to be implemented and of course have resources 
to, um, to make sure to do that. So we'll be, I think, more partnering with some of the technology firms out there. Um, they, certainly, they can lower costs and increase transaction speed. Again, when things happen automatically, um, you, you can't back out. Of course, pros and cons to that as well. You know, something that happens automatically. Uh, there, there, there. You know, there are many issues with that. Not the least of which is not really knowing the parties to the transaction necessarily. Not having to know the parties to transaction because, again, if it is taking place on the blockchain automatically, people are identified by keys, cryptographic keys, and not name. So who do you sue? Who so goes wrong? Many issues. So don't worry. Um, we, we as lawyers are not going away by any stretch, but I'm, you know, I, so are your clients using smart contracts? I'd be curious, um, you know, if, if anyone, you know, if you show hands or, or if anybody um, has clients who are using smart contracts and you have had uh, some dealings and, and had to deal with us anytime recently or yet. Usually, usually I get no, but people are starting to ask questions is what I usually hear. Yeah. Um, so I'd be curious, you know, how, you know, how are they using them? Why? What industry? What are some of the issues? These are probably questions for the future. If nobody has approached you yet to integrate smart contract technology into some sort of an agreement, um, it'll probably happen. Attorneys also are using um, smart contract technology as well. Um, yes. Okay. So I did get it down. So one of our attendees, yes, my healthcare technology company change healthcare is using blockchain. So great. Um, that is uh, um, uh, the, the way that is going to, you're most going to commonly see is some of me uh, an online presence in a regulated area who want to have this um, immutable distributed ledger to keep good track of records and healthcare industry is, is perfect for them. Uh, so, and I'm, I'm, it'll be, you know, feel free to, to jump in if there are any stories or, or what your involvement might be. I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat. Um, you know, and of course, are lawyers going away? Um, you know, as, you know, those of you who have clients who are using this technology, you know, I would have to say, of course not, because if anything, we're more necessary. But we also really need to make sure that we are keeping up with the, um, at least understanding the issues and enough knowledge to know when to bring in maybe someone with the technical background and what the potential ramifications might be. You know, the smart contract seems like a great idea um, or the you know, automatic functionality of a, some terms of the contract. Hey, if this event happens, um, then automatically payment is issued. That's terrific. But again, you want to make sure that there are enough um, safeguards in place uh, because there are certainly ramifications of something automatically well what, you know what is your recourse then you, know, you say you know if this product is delivered then payment is made what if the product is faulty what if there is you know whatever the case may be um, they you want to make sure that your clients understand the ramifications of something happening automatically great and efficient uh, but not without its issues so these are important um, and one of the other biggest applications of the blockchain technology that you might start seeing with your clients is supply chain, supply chain applications. Using this distributed, mostly immutable um, digital letter, ledger for agreements. I keep talking about immutable and we'll talk about the, you know, the possibility of hacking and, and cyber crime and such just briefly because we all know it's out there, but it, for the most part, it's very hard to do. So we've got this digital ledger tracking payments, all of this can happen on the blockchain. And that solves transparency because it's out there in this public blockchain. Again, you know, it is just identified by keys and not necessarily parties. We have um, public and private blockchains. So and a private blockchain might, you know, might be easier to know who you're dealing with. And that's something that's going to be probably very common for, for a company dealing with suppliers for supply chain applications. Um, you fraud, anything that is a problem with supply chain can really be solved in a degree by using blockchain technology. Businesses have been doing this for years. Walmart, Nestle, Tyson, Unilever, Dole, many others use blockchain to report product and source information. So from the beginning, we know where a product came from. Um, suppliers of diamonds, other gems, 
are starting to use blockchain technology to track stones from the mining to the sale so that they have a ledger that shows um, authenticity. This is where it came from. The void gems that are uh, you know, ob obtained through conflict, child labor. There are a lot of issues with the origin of something like diamonds. So this is another great supply chain application of blockchain technology. And this slide um, is just, uh, I, I won't uh, belabor it, but um, you know, this is a great representation. I took it from uh, Resolve Solution Partners. There, there's a link to them. They are in South Africa, but this is a really one of the better representations that I have seen of the a blockchain record and you know, sort of trying to visualize how it works, for instance, for a supply chain application. So um, we have, um, you know, we have the original, the certificate of origin, vast first processing data, you know, shipment data all the way through the process. And then it, there will be embedded a smart contract that, you know, when X happens, then Y is the result. And, you know, it's a smart contract might be embedded and it moves on through the chain. You can see all the different kinds of information that can be there on this ledger that is really, um, you know, it won't move forward unless the conditions that are programmed to happen, happen, and it can't be changed. Someone can't forget to enter one of the order numbers or what have you. It's all going to be taken care of on this immutable, you know, decentralized ledger. And there are a lot of benefits to those who deal with supply chain to be able to, to work this way. So, and you know, through the very end, again, the little, um, little circles uh, represent when maybe a smart contract might be embedded, you know, matching things. Again, you're just making sure that if one and two, then three, right? If one, two, three, then four, you know, this is when, you know, when, when um, the payments happen and they happen automatically, the funds are available in whatever the native, you know, currency is, whatever, whatever has been set up or could be bank out, you know, it could be virtual currency like we use now with that automatic transfer from a specific bank account, what, whatever it is, then that is available. I think this is a, um, you know, really interesting uh, to look at these kinds of possibilities for the use of blockchain technology. And again, I think our clients are really going to see this more and more. Um, more possibilities, right? We've talked about cryptocurrency, which we'll address again briefly, and supply chain. Um, but really, uh, there are a lot of other applications that you can imagine and that already are out there. Anything from retail loyalty rewards programs, the automatic tracking of those rewards cards. We've got a rewards number for everything now if we use them. And um, that can be something that the blockchain technology is applied for. Intellectual property protection, a immutable ledger that records intellectual property ownership. Um, digital voting, that's a hot topic, right? Title transfers, your real estate, um, medical record keeping, I know is one that's it's more and more widely used. Um, tracking prescription drugs, we have an issue with that. Weapons, right? Um, there, there's just a, one of those, uh, yeah, some of the most difficult, some of the, some of the most wicked problems that we have, you know, potentially could be uh, you know, ameliorated through the use of blockchain technology. Um, forensic chain of custody for attorneys uh, in the legal system, I think is a really interesting application as well. Um, establishing chain of custody through uh, blockchain uh, will potentially be hugely beneficial in, it, it, you know, to the extent that a court of law will accept that. We'll also talk about that briefly. And more recently, the EU is actually now requiring a record of, you know, of um, emissions. And, you know, in, so you look at the, the concept of emissions and carbon footprints, and, you know, you can actually automatically, you know, track emissions and keep a letter of that um, to add to the many things that might be regulated. Um, certainly in the EU, they're, they're advancing that a little more quickly, but certainly we might have regulation uh, in that regard as well. And the blockchain technology can be used to back up that kind of, 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 of record keeping. And, and many more, whatever you can imagine. Uh, so again, I briefly before mentioned crypto crime is are there downsides absolutely are there upsides absolutely um many advantages first of all upside to trustworthy transactions on a global level you can deal without a centralized authority and get things done without having to trust the other partner party because the you know, the, the conditions are programmed in um and or if it's not a smart contract type 
opportunity. Yeah, certainly, it is something that is available nonetheless on an immutable distributed ledger. Uh, cryptocurrency exchanges have been attractive targets for hackers. As we know, crypto crime related um, $14 billion in 2021, not insignificant, but it is only 0.15% of all of the virtual currency volume out there. So it is a small part, but nonetheless, a very visible part and, and always a risk. You know, hacking into uh, a cryptocurrency exchange is, is something that, that has happened. Um, new global regulatory challenges, including illegal trade, money laundering, um, potentially facilitating facilitated because of the an anonymity of these transactions. This is our concern. Um, Ukraine, uh, well, I'll briefly mention Ukraine because um, Ukraine and, and the, the war in Ukraine has um, really kind of put to the fore a lot of mostly cryptocurrency related um, issues. But um, they absolutely have issues with crypto supported shadow economy for criminal transactions, tax fraud, hidden movement of funds. They also put forth a platform to legalize officially the use of cryptocurrency and have been able to take in many donations um, through cryptocurrency that have supported some of their defensive efforts. So it has been uh, something that's really kind of uh, one of the more visible cryptocurrency uh, chain examples on, on the world stage. But you know, will Russia then be able to avoid sanctions through cryptocurrency? Is the you know, kind of the back end of that whole situation? You know, the the the, the people who know say probably not because the crypto market isn't nearly large enough. Um, there are anti-money laundering rules that are applying, and we will we'll talk about briefly what you know how how that might work um, at least in, in the U.S. for our purposes. Um, and you know, there are all sorts of should Russian crypto assets be frozen? Should crypto exchanges have the authority to even do that? These are issues that are um, still absolutely up in the air because the crypto exchanges really aren't exactly sure what the rules look like. Um, but you know, cryptocurrency based on this blockchain technology has been really taking off on the global stage. Um, after the Taliban took over in Afghanistan, um, banks failed like crazy, cash dried up. So access to crypto has actually been crucial um, on an individual basis there. So there really are a lot of reasons that crypto probably isn't going away anytime soon. Um, but we did talk about, so, so to, to, the, to the hacking issue, um, we did talk about the fact that, well, if someone can take over a majority of a platform's computational power, they actually can get in and change the, you know, ostensibly almost immutable characteristic of the blockchain. And this is known as a 51% attack, if they have more than, more than half to be able to do this, and they can go in and reverse transactions and actually make a change. Um, and, and the purported inability to double spend on this uh, blockchain ledger is really one of the main purposes that, it, or one of the main features, I guess, that was, that was promoted way back in 2008. The fact that it has to be a verified transaction, and once it is verified, it can't be verified again because the money is already gone kind of thing. So, um, so this is one of the issues that is, is a feature, but it is possible to take over enough power to back, back end, um, go in and change the transactions. Very unlikely, less and less unlikely. And the, again, the amount of uh, computational power needed is absolutely huge. So it, it's, it's, not like, it's not likely on a mass scale, but it has happened. Ethereum, for instance, um, in January 20 19 was a victim of a three-day 51% attack, and the, about 1.1 million was lost. Um, smaller attacks were reported as early as 2016. Again, they are becoming fewer because the computational power necessary to do so is becoming vast as these platforms grow. But it's still a concern. There's no question it's still a risk. Um, if, obviously, Ethereum carries on despite the attack. Uh, it wasn't fatal. Um, so, what are the regulatory and evidentiary uncertainties? They're pretty much everything you can possibly think of, right? We really don't know this still, although the technology has been available since 2008, the first Bitcoin transaction was in 2009, we still really have a lot of uncertainty as far as what 
the regulations are, who the regulations regulators are, and how this affects the users of this technology. It's, it gets chaos right now still. Um, legal uncertainty will make you know investigation relating to blockchain technology more tentative, just as it makes the use of the technology a little more risky for us and for our clients. Um, and most laws that address criminal evidence and investigations focus on centralized services and don't specifically address online providers, as is the case, as we know, with everything that relates to technology and the new technologies that are cropping up every day. Um, you've got old laws trying to apply to situations that weren't contemplated when the laws were drafted. Still an issue in this realm, you know, tenfold probably. We've got this peer-to-peer -peer network um, that drives technology, the blockchain technology. Again, we've got a whole lot of different nodes and individuals making up the network. It's decentralized. There's not a central authority. Um, and that, you know, when that has evidence, right, necessary to support maybe a criminal indictment, contract claim, forensic experts are, are challenged because not only is the access to maybe this encrypted anonymized data difficult, without the benefit of a centralized server, right? Because we usually don't know who is who on the public blockchain because of the private keys, just the number. Um, but laws also are absolutely untested as they relate to this area. And I would add the courts, the attorneys, we, we, really, we really don't know, right? We really don't know and maybe don't understand a lot of this technology. So I do want to take a, a step back just because cryptocurrency is the biggest use of blockchain technology and one that we um, have been seeing a lot lately about yeah, the first Bitcoin transaction 2009. Now there are more than 18,000 different cryptocurrencies as of this year, although many of them have very little or no value at all. They're, they're cropping up like mad over these past several years. Bitcoin, Ether are the biggest. We've talked about those. And as you also know, fluctuating value, also like that, right? Bitcoin's, Bitcoin's all-time high value was $68,789.63, $68,000. As of yesterday, it was about 20. So, and we've seen it, it dropped a little below, so I think it's low as 17 in recent weeks, um, but it is fluctuating and super unstable and risky, which is why I would never give investment advice um, by any stretch because we just don't know. Um, Ether was, that they, they had an all-time high of 4,800 or so, and as of yesterday, it was about 1,300 per token. So, you know, it, it fluctuates and, and it's risky. And when you're looking at investing or using uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, you, if your clients are using it, if you're contemplating taking payment in uh, cryptocurrency, a whole nother issue. That primary, one of the biggest issues of that is the fluctuating value and the fact that what if you, you know, the value of your services, say you bill, you know, you, $12,000 and um, you get $12,000 worth of today's Bitcoin. Well, what if it suddenly rockets up and then you've got, um, you know, $24,000, $58,000. Is that unearned you know, income? That's an ethical issue, whatever. There are a lot of issues like that that we want to think about if you're looking at accepting cryptocurrency. Um, the ABA, the you know, state bars really don't know exactly what to do with that right now. But that's, a, again, another one of the red flags you want to look for. Um, so we have it, Bitcoin, we have Ether. Um, we also have what's known as a stable coin, which is a digital asset like Bitcoin and Ether and all the others, but pegged to a fiat currency or a, you know official government's currency like the US dollar or the EU euro. Um, so, um, or, or some, another external reference asset. You know, it might be gold or silver or some such. Um, Tether, DM, USD coin, um, these are all popular stable coins. I think the idea is they're pegged to a fiat currency or another asset. They should be more stable. But again, we saw in the news down there was one Terra that trades as Luna, traded as Luna, crashed from $120 worth um, of value to 0.02 in May and further crashed another 99, crashed 99% of its value, another 99% eventually, you know, worth virtually nothing. And was delisted. Um, so, so this is concerning. You know, that sounded a lot of alarm. So these are supposed to be the stable coins, and that doesn't seem very stable. And they, they're still unsure how um, they're calling this. You know, they lost their peg. They're sure not really not sure how this happened. Um, 
So again, the uncertainty is vast. And the suspicion that we know, uh, you know, many of you are probably suspicious. There's a lot of suspicion out there. It's, it's not unwarranted, right? There's no question that you know, I'm not gonna tell you that, oh, it's all gonna be great. And this is the future. And you must invest in these things. Your clients must embrace these wholeheartedly. There are a lot of risks and a lot of issues. Um, there also is the concept of a central bank digital currency, CBDC. Um, that is accessible by the public as the liability of the central bank. So there is a centralized party that is backing the digital currency. And this year, um, the Fed, the Federal Reserve started looking into um, the possibility of a US CBDC and released a, a paper. Um, they're looking for authorizing law, agency, public support. They're like, well, let's say we did this. Would there be support? You know, what is the law that applies? So that is still under consideration. Um, comments were open until May, um, so it would be interesting to see what happens, but certainly it's continuing to be relevant. Um, just to talk about some of the uh, regulators that are in, you know, that are, that, are, that are in this space for our, from our perspective as attorneys, right? Um, so here, here's who we have to be concerned about as of today. Um, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, um, they say cryptocurrencies are not legal tender, but crypto tokens are other value that substitutes for currency. Therefore, we get to be a regulator. They're saying, they say exchanges, cryptocurrency exchanges are legal, which you would imagine since there are so many of them, and subject to the Bank Secrecy Act. So they must register with FinCEN and comply with anti-money laundering requirements. So that right there is a requirement and something to consider. Um, the IRS says cryptocurrency is not legal tender, but defines it as a digital representation of value that functions as a medium of exchange, unit of account, and or store of value. Therefore, you know, we think most transactions are taxable. The SEC, well, we don't see Bitcoin and Ether as securities, but other might be, or we talked about the Howey test. And securities laws do apply to digital wallets and exchanges. And you know, certainly, there, so there's this concept of an initial coin op offering, ICO, as opposed to an IPO, um, which actually there haven't been a lot of them since the SEC says, oh yeah, wait, that's an offering for securities. So if you haven't uh, registered and aren't complying with our regulations, um, you're going to be you're going to run a follow us, and that's not cool. Um, there are fewer fewer of them, um, but the SEC is absolutely involved with anything that looks like a an offering or an invitation to invest. Anything that um, that um, satisfies the Howey test. Uh, we have the Commodity Futures Trading Commission um, says, well, actually, crypto is a commodity, right? Um, so there were 35 bills regarding crypto policy proposed um, in the, the re most recent 117th Congress, mostly bipartisan. This is absolutely a bipartisan issue, which is, which is interesting to see. Um, so uh, March 9th, uh, an executive order from President Biden, the executive order was ensuring responsible development of digital assets. You know, if, if all of this seems a little chaotic, as I mentioned before, it, it, it is. And you know, basically the president, the executive orders is get it together. Um, looking for alignment in approach to regulation, um, focus on consumers, investors, business protection, as well as, of course, financial stability. Um, the more that we get cryptocurrencies embedded in our economy, the more concern we have about stability, especially in the absence of clear regulation, um, which we really don't have right now. Um, so we're going to U.S. leadership, national security, all of these things are a concern and something that the president said, we really need to address this. And, um, and I'm looking for more information basically from the players that I've listed above. Um, it absolutely supports research and development and regarding a possible U.S. Um, central bank digital currency. Uh, it also wants coordination, multiple reports um, from these players um, by September. So in a couple months, it will be very interesting to see what the players come up with, when the agencies come up with, um, maybe if the Federal Reserve, the Attorney General, uh, and all of these agencies are involved in some way. And um, it will be very interesting to see what regulation looks like. So that's something that might eventually provide a little more guidance. Um, but right now, 
don't have even consensus among these potential regulators as to what you know what what is cryptocurrency what is the way that we need to regulate this blockchain technology who is the regulator um all of these things are absolutely up in the air and make it very difficult to advise clients when we are looking at these issues but i mentioned throughout some of the red flag issues that we have and that's something that um you at least want to well i, I suppose anytime anyone brings up a smart contract the blockchain technology something that is based in cryptocurrency that in and of itself is a red flag and you really want to think about some of these issues going forward and how that is going to potentially affect your clients and who you need to bring in. You know, if you're not a securities lawyer, you have a maybe a small business client who wants to say, well, it's like, well, you know, we've been dabbling with this idea of an initial coin offer. We want our own coin. Who doesn't want their own coin? Or, or we're going to sell NFTs to raise money for um, expansion or what have you. You know, these are all issues that you, you might well need to bring in another legal expert or a technology expert. So I think this is really just one of the important things to keep in mind. So here, you know, so again, opportunities, absolutely, promises, absolutely, challenges, risks, perils, also huge. Um, the promise is, look, this block containing transactional data, all of this information where it can be seen, confirmed, is really very difficult, in, in some cases almost impossible to change. This ledger involved multiple parties, it all is neatly put there for you, that's, that's a good thing. And global reaction to crypto's role before and during, um, the, again, the Russian war in, in Ukraine highlights some of the efforts to regulate crypto and blockchain technology and related challenges. You know, countries who are um, involved in a potential financial crisis have turned to quickly to cryptocurrency. And it really is interesting to see, you know, are, are, we, are we in a recession right now? Are we facing a potential recession? Um, how will crypto affect our economy? I mean, these are, you know, these are little bigger issues than probably most of us deal with day to day. Nonetheless, something to keep in the back of our minds. Um, challenges, regulatory uncertainties relating to the use of blockchain technology, huge, right? We really are in chaos. I, I, as I mentioned, I teach law and regulation of blockchain technology. I mean, that's going to be fun, right? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to finally be one of those traditional law school professors. I don't know. What do you think? We don't know. Uncertainties and risks inherent in widely adopting a developing technology platform is always a thing, no matter what the technology platform is. Um, challenges in identity management, criminal accountability, right? There, there, there's a certain amount of the anonymity that is of a concern. Um, steep learning curve within the legal industry. Can you know how are the courts going to handle this? How are we going to handle this? You know, our clients, us, the courts. Um, retention of personal data also that is immutable on these blocks, unalterable for the most part, creates a vexing problem in terms of deletion requests under some privacy laws. California, for instance, um, many of the states that are coming up with, um, with their own privacy laws in the absence of federal legislation in this area are requiring you know, the right to be erased, the right to be forgotten. Um, as is the case in the EU, which if you have global clients, that's also another issue. Um, you know, how can you erase something that is supposed to not be able to be erased? So all sorts of you know, challenges without question. Uh, forensic challenges, you know, we talked about the public private key the, um, you know, it, it's great because you can verify integrity and authenticity, but it also can be problematic in terms of identifying a party to a specific, a, a specific transaction. As we talked about, the anonymity is an issue. Contract enforcement can be challenging if the party is masked. I mentioned that up front, and that is one of the bigger concerns. Um, you know, who knows if today's crypto client climate and the, you know, suddenly surge forward that we're seeing in other countries accepting cryptocurrency as a legal tender. Um, you know, El Salvador is the first to do it. But, um, uh, the the uh, African Republic just, just, just joined in as well. Many countries are recognizing Australia has its certain views, but many countries are recognizing cryptocurrency as a legal tender or at least defining the uh, the regulations surrounding it a little more clearly. Um, so maybe this will be pushed in a direction that makes it more sustainable to use, right? Um, we we'll mentioned chain of custody. We're not doing it in the US, but in China, there are, they have three internet courts that are available for online disputes and internet court judge in China indicated that since digital data stored on a blockchain can't be altered, it has legal effect. So you know, will that be something that happens more globally? Um, 
there are again states are considering it the eu um, has added some language and is considering a uh, more thorough or more, more comprehensive language it talks about the use of information stored in the blockchain as evidence okay? and again what the states have going on is available for, from the national council of state legislatures so <laughs> so wrapping up i know we, we really just got started and there are so many issues out there that are unanswered but that is unfortunately the, the truth right now is there's a lot of uncertainty um opportunities to embrace blockchain tech blockchain technology um you know as an enduring part of our clients transactions an important part of the digital forensic process are, are promising if controversial there's no question um, there's still a lot of suspicion that this is going to be something that actually is going to be a sustainable use of blockchain technology. Um, of course, education of all legal industry players, focused efforts towards globally consistent legislative and regulatory approach, because so many of our transactions are not just within one state, let alone within the US. Um, so we really need to look for a consistent approach to the rules and regulations uh, as well. I think that would be at least uh, you know something that would support the success of this kind of technology being used for wider scale. Really hard to know the benefits, you know, right? Outweigh the peril, you know. Does the promise outweigh the peril? I think it's too soon to know, but we know that there certainly are both in play. Um, it will be interesting to see uh, what happens. So, you know, are you ready? Was my was my last question. Are you ready to move forward and you know keep an eye on on the on the screen and see what happens? Um, I do. I did want to leave a couple minutes in case there are any questions because I I, I know I forage forward with a um, you know, lot of uh, a lot of information, but I'm happy to answer any questions. The answer might be I have no idea. That's a great question, but um, there or or hear your comments or experiences in the last couple minutes that we have. If you and you're do welcome to unmute yourself as well. Yeah, so feel free to enter questions in the chat while we're waiting for those to come in. I'm actually curious if you have heard anything about, um, you know, you mentioned the, the valuation issue with the cryptocurrency. Are you seeing any impact in the in the family law in a divorce context or in um, estate law? Sure, you know, absolutely. Um, you know, absolutely. More and more estates, more and more assets you know, sets that could be divided in some way during a dispute, family or business, right, um, are potentially tied up in cryptocurrency. And this can have a, a huge effect. And again, that's a great application that attorneys who are in that field want to pay attention to. Are some of these assets um, in cryptocurrency? You know, if, if you're saying, oh, you know, I want my client to get all the crypto and, and give out anything else because this is gonna make, make uh, them a billionaire, um, you know, <laughs> you've got to remember there's so much fluctuation and you really want to be careful in drafting and you might want to consider um you know sarah's question you know it makes me think of uh, you know some solutions that you might want to consider you know putting in language of any kind of agreement business or family etc um that um that, you know that addresses what happens if the value of the cryptocurrency goes you know you know there's a certain floor or a certain ceiling or what have you you really want to think about the future and think about how you deal with this as an extremely volatile asset. It's a great question. Um, what sources do you consult to stay on top of news in this area? Another great question. I would say probably one of the most comprehensive courses is Coindesk. Coindesk.com um, has daily news, an overwhelming amount of news, but daily news about some of the highlights, what's going on. You can subscribe to get emails if you want, um, you get a lot of them. I, I don't necessarily recommend it, but Coindesk is really a good and reliable source of up-to-date information. Um, Coinbase is one of the biggest exchanges and also has a lot of really good background information out there. You know, there, there's a lot, if you're going to Google information about Bitcoin, you're going to get a lot of stuff about someone trying to you know, sell you the best way to invest, you know, but, but I'd say coin, Coindesk and Coinbase are um, good initial sources for information. And I think and it, if you want to get more into the area, you know, subscribe to some of the emails, they'll give you a daily digest, or as, as often as you want a digest of, of what the top news is. Other questions? They have much more information than I did, than I can possibly impart in an hour. Well, I don't see any other questions here, um, and we are just about at time. So um, 
we can go ahead and wrap up for for today.